Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of the Pope Francis Generation. Uh, today we are joined by a special guest, Mark Shea. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Good to have you Glad with us. Glad to be here. Paul, take it away. Why do we have Mark on for uh, an episode today? Yeah, for a couple of reasons. The first is to talk about his book that came out a couple of years ago, uh, The Church's Best Kept Secret. Um, and then also because uh, in my own growth as a Catholic in the past 10 years in understanding the church's uh, social teaching and in my own um, social and political thought, Mark Shea's writing has played um, a key role in that. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk with him today. Grateful to hear that. All right, fantastic. Well, why don't we just dive in? Let's get past the uh, intro for those who haven't yet heard of our show yet. Hello and welcome to the Pope Francis Generation. It is the show for Catholics struggling with the church's teaching who feel they might not belong in the church anymore and who still hunger for a God of love and goodness. Your hosts are me, Paul Fahey, a professional catechist. I'm Dominic, someone who needs catechesis. Together, we're taking our own look at the Catholic Church, their teachings and practices from three views that changed our world. And those are the charisma, the doctrine of theosis, and the teachings of Pope Francis. Together with you, we're the Pope Francis generation. Over to you, Paul. Can you uh, breeze us through Mark's um, introduction, his bio, for those who have never heard of him? Yes. So, so Mark Shea, is, uh, he's a Catholic writer and speaker. He's the author of a number of books, in, including By What Authority and Evangelical Discovers Catholic Tradition, as well as uh, The Church's Best Kept Secret, a primer on Catholic social teaching. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, and he's known nationally for his one-minute words of encouragement on Catholic radio. Uh, Mark Shea also maintains the popular blog Stumbling Towards Heaven, um, and he is an internationally known speaker on various issues in the Catholic faith. Mark, thank a you for pleasure. being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I want to start by, by talking about your book, The Church's Best Kept mm -hmm. Secret. Um, this is the most accessible book I've encountered on Catholic social teaching, which is a big deal because Catholic social teaching, I mean, I think it's pretty fantastic, but uh, it's kind of intimidating to get into. Right. The encyclicals are um, less than approachable, um, but but your book is really approachable, and if you can see, you know, it's only like 140 pages, which is exactly the kind of book that mm -hmm. I like to read. Um, so I, I, I wanted to ask about uh, the reason you wrote the book, your experience writing the book, and then why do you think Catholic social teaching is the church's best kept secret? Uh, okay. Well, my experience of writing the book was kind of a twofold thing. I, I Initially, I had written a series of articles for the National Catholic Register, laying out Catholic social teaching. Uh, and the, the, as the book uh, uh, does, uh, it was divided into the four pillars of Catholic social teaching. So the image that I use in the book uh, that comes straight from uh, the compendium uh, of uh, the Church's social doctrine uh, is that Catholic social teaching is like a, a throne with four legs and those legs have to be of equal length, and they have to be of equal strength. You can't privilege uh, one leg over others or two legs over others, because if you do that, you get the same thing as you get if you have a chair with two really long legs and two uh, short legs. Uh, it tips over, and that which is enthroned on Catholic social teaching, meaning the human person, falls off the throne. Uh, and so uh, those four pillars of Catholic social teaching are the dignity of the human person, the common good, uh, subsidiarity, sorry for the three dollar words, these are the words that the church uses, uh, and <laughs> solidarity. Our, I, I tell a story at the beginning of the book that kind of sums up what I'm trying to do with the book. I was asked to give a talk on Catholic social teaching uh, a few years back in the parish that invited me out. Uh, there was the great mass of Catholics who were just there to hear what I had to say. Then on one side of the room, there was the peace and justice group. 
And on the other side of the room was the pro-life group. And those two groups hated each other's guts and didn't trust one another as far as they could throw them. And, you know, me, uh, talking about Catholic social teaching, I'm, guy, I'm looking at these guys going, you're on the same side. You're supposed to be on the same side because we're all here to implement Catholic teachings. So why this weird civil war? Well, the reason for that weird civil war is that most Americans uh, and most Catholics in the United States, and I would guess around the world as well, but especially here where it's very polarized, they get their moral and social uh, uh, thinking not from the church, but from, you know, family members or Fox News or MSNBC or what, you know, the loudest voice at the water cooler at work has to say about things. And so we live in a time and a place where people don't evaluate, evaluate uh, their worldview in light of the church's teaching. They evaluate the church's teaching in light of a worldview that they get from some other source that has nothing to do with the tradition. Consequently, uh, uh, as Americans, what we tend to do is cannibalize church teaching in order to accessorize th those bits of our politics or whatever that we happen to find useful in the church's teaching. Uh, and when the church says something that doesn't agree with this political, social, economic framework that we've built out of God knows what, uh, it's the church that gets rejected. So this is why we see, for example, a, a significant uh, portion of, you know, as uh, the website that you write for, where Peter is, uh, is constantly having to deal with, we get people who uh, have incredibly have you know declared the Pope a heretic, not because he disagrees with the church's teaching, but because he disagrees with their political and economic and, and social doctrines that they acquired from, again, Fox News or you know wherever. Uh, so I wrote the book so that Catholics could hear a, a presentation of those four pillars of Catholic social teaching and, of course, their implications uh, for all kinds of other things um, and begin to, perhaps, I hope, uh, practice the habit of evaluating their politics, their finances, their uh, uh, you know, their uh, understanding of, y you name it, how education should work, how, you know, how they should vote, all, all, how we are to live out our faith in light of the church's teaching rather than subjecting the church's teaching to uh, the acid bath of some human ideology. Uh, yeah, so that's why I wrote the book. Um, and I learned things while yeah. I was writing it, so that was... That was fun. Uh, for me, the the thing that always motivates me to write, I uh, I became a writer because I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, and the the drawback of being a teacher was that uh, teaching puts you in a situation where you're often faced with people who don't want to be there, who don't want to listen because they've got other things they want to do or they find the thing that you're teaching boring or whatever. I thought, if I become a writer, then the only people I'm speaking to are the people who want to read what I wrote, or they wouldn't be reading it. Uh, and so I knew what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the faith and the things that pertain to it, because I find it fascinating and beautiful and liberating. Uh, and so when I learn something, my first impulse is always, i got to tell somebody else this. This is super cool. And that was my experience of writing about Catholic social teaching was this is fantastic and one of the things that I discovered and one of the things that people discover when they read the church's best-kept secret is they go but I already knew this 
I like, yes, you did. Uh, because much of what the church has to say is stuff that you already knew. You just kind of didn't know you knew it. Uh, and so um, watching the lights come on for other people is, for me, that's what, that's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, I love watching that happen when people go, well, this is cool. I go, yes, it is. That's why I read about this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I worked at, uh, I worked as a catechist at a parish for seven and yeah. a half years. And I, and I appreciated RCIA a lot more than I appreciated uh, eighth grade catechism class because the eighth graders did not right. want to be there. But the people, but the people entering the church, they were yeah. hungry. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's just, it's a huge blessing to be a teacher with students. Yeah, who are hungry. yeah it is. It, and when, you know, when the gospel, uh, scratches where people are itching, that is, it is so cool to watch that happen. And when it challenges people, uh, can often be, you know, sometimes, I mean, you read sometimes moments in the gospel where Jesus challenged his people. The rich young man is kind of a classic example of that, where they go, but I didn't want to be challenged. You know, I wanted you to tell me how awesome I am. <laughs> and, you know, that can yeah. happen. But there's lots of times, too, where Jesus challenges people in the gospel and they stay with him. Uh, even if they don't understand, I mean, the, you know, the classic example of that is, of course, Jesus saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Most of the disciples are like, I'm, I'm out, you know. Um, but Peter doesn't go. Peter says, to who, where else should we go? You're the one with the words of eternal life. And he stays. He doesn't understand, but he stays. Uh and that, you know, that's kind of all I'm asking for when I'm presenting the gospel. Uh, there's going to there's stuff the church teaches that I'm like, I I don't know what to do with this. You know, I. Just, but you have the words of eternal life, so I'm going to stay until I understand what's going on. And so, you know, there are things that for years that I haven't understood. And, and there are some things that I think we, you know, we will never understand. Um, I, I'm writing a book on the creed right now. <laughs> you know, and I mean, if you ever talk to a Catholic who goes, I got this, the creed, it's a snap. <laughs> it's like, you're lying. You do not know what you're talking about, you know. And it's the same with the real presence, for example. I mean, I believe the real presence. I couldn't. I don't understand it. How could I understand it, this puny brain, you know. Um, but we're challenged by the gospel to live it out. And in a certain sense... The promise is that he who does the will of the Father will understand the doctrine, not necessarily the other way around. Yeah. Um, so you try to do what Jesus says, uh, and the lights start to come on as you try to obey. Um, yeah, I, I, I had, I had a really wonderful experience a couple of months ago. Um, I used your book as an outline for. Uh, a day-long retreat uh -huh. that I did for a parish on Catholic yeah. social teaching. And um, I went into that retreat, and I set it up in a way where I'm like, my role here is the catechist. I'm going to present what the church teaches. I'm going to put it on the table in mm -hmm. front of you. And all I invite you to do is consider it and yeah. pray with it. Um, and we did that. And there were you know times of group discussion. And... There was feedback, there was pushback. People people were being challenged, right. but nobody left. Good. Everyone every everyone stuck it out. Go um, <laughs> success. <laughs> That's all you need, you know. Yeah. 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 There was one woman, and I think I've may have shared this story with Dominic before, where during the question time, this is. Just after I had taught some of the teachings from the church fathers about 
um, the extra food in your cupboard you have stolen from the right. Poor, right. And she says in the group discussion, she says, hey, those passages from the church fathers, you know, you catch a lot more flies with honey than you do vinegar. And that tasted a lot like vinegar. And I said, you're right. Mm -hmm. It does. But it's still there. Right. And and because it's there, it challenges us and it imposes on us. And we have to our our role is just to respond right. to it. Um, yeah, because there's a lot of Catholic social teaching uh, that tastes like vinegar, sure. uh, especially if you are a person with yeah. means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, some. I mean, some of it is shocking. Uh, uh, Saint John Chrysostom, for example, remarks. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but. Um, St. John Chrysostom remarks uh, at one point, he says that uh, the rich exist for the sake of the poor. The poor exist for the salvation of the rich. Uh, wow. That should make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Uh, and this really is, this. he's not just coming up with that himself, this is something that is a theme all through Jesus' teaching. That's what the parable of the sheep and the goats is about. Uh, it is also, oddly, what the parable of the uh, of the uh, unjust steward is about. Uh, one of the strangest parables that Jesus ever told. But it, it comes back to something that, uh, interestingly, has only really been spelled out uh, in the conciliar teaching of the church since Vatican II. Um, w- one of the things that wears me out are the, the arguments about, you know, Vatican II wasn't a dogmatic council and therefore we can ignore it. It's like, okay, we do not as Catholics live by the uh, minimum daily adult requirement uh, doctrine that you know you only have to pay attention to the church if if it's pronouncing a dogma, and the rest of the time you can just blow it off. Um, that's just not how we actually think. It's 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 like I compare it to, you know, the bride who goes to the priest on her wedding day and asks, "What is the absolute bare minimum that I have to kiss my husband?" It's like if you're asking that question, lady, <laughs> you are not prepared for marriage you know that's not how we enter into a relationship of love is what's the absolute bare minimum contact i have to have with the beloved i'll just do that and then i fulfilled the requirement um one of the things that took place at vatican ii is the church says in oh no i'm blanking on i think it's gaudium at spes um the church says something absolutely shocking and revolutionary, uh, something that the church had never, ever before put in these words. Uh, She says that man is the only creature on earth whom God has willed for his own sake. Now, there's a reason that the church says this at Vatican II. The church, all councils... Uh, are situated in a historical context. They are, in part, always a response to what's going on right now or what recently went on. So the Council of Jerusalem is a response to uh, a notion that had grown up in the Church at Jerusalem that Gentiles all have to observe uh, Jewish laws uh, in order to be Christians. And the Council said, that's not true. What's happening? uh, What's the historical context? Of the Second Vatican Council, the 20th century, and the horrors thereof. Um, And so what the church does at Vatican II in making that statement is this, again, it's not saying anything new. We are made in the image and likeness of God, uh, and therefore our dignity springs from that fact. Uh, And a consequence of that is... No economic, no political, 
no scientific, no social, no philosophical, no ecclesial system, by the way, is more important than the human person made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, and so, as you know, as Jesus puts it, the law is made for man, or the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, and that's what the council is getting at. It's it's summarizing something that's always been latent in the tradition, but it's never summarized it in those words and in that way before. And one, and then yeah, go ahead. And and then John Paul II. And then it, again, Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti, he articulates it as every human person has infinite dignity. Right. That's the word yeah. they use. Is it's infinite. a shocking statement. Uh, and one of the weird things about, uh, I would call that statement, by the way, that, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sneeze. Is this going to screw us up? Am I going to blow your ears off when I sneeze? You know how you've got it when you've like got the sneeze in the back of your nose and it's not quite there, but it's going to be there very soon? That's where we are if right you want, now. You can just mute yourself when so, that comes up. So anyway, I'm making Paul laugh here. Um, but the, the weird thing about uh, doctrinal developments, and I would argue that that statement by the council is arguably the most significant and dynamite laden uh, uh, doctrinal development of the last 500 years at least. Uh, I don't think anything comes close to that statement. So when people tell me Vatican II you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't contribute anything important to the history of the church, it's like you, have, you don't even begin to grasp how important that statement is. And the weird thing about doctrinal developments uh, in the history of the church is because uh, the Holy Spirit is at work in a council and in a, particularly in a doctrinal development like this, the human actors who articulate uh, the doctrinal development by the power of the Holy Spirit do not themselves fully comprehend the implications. Uh, so you can see that, for example, in Acts 15. It's Peter who says, we are saved by grace through faith and not by works of the law. Uh, Gentiles don't need to, you know, uh, be circumcised and all the rest of it and keep kosher. This is something that Peter is able to do by the power of the Holy Spirit in union with the council. And then what happens? The council adjourns and Peter goes off to Antioch and immediately starts hanging back from hanging around with Gentiles and will only eat with his fellow G And Paul finally has to say, Peter, you yourself <laughs> said that Gentiles do not have to keep uh, uh, kosher and, and all the rest of it. So this is something that often happens in the life of the church. The church will articulate something by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then... The church adjourns from its council. The bishops go back to their respective uh, dioceses, and they don't know what they said. They don't understand the implications of what they themselves taught. And then it takes like a, a hundred years or five hundred years for the church to figure out what she herself taught. It's a very weird phenomenon. And so we see this, for example, in the life of the church. The church says nothing is more important than the dignity of the human person. The council adjourns, the bishops go back to their respective sees and start telling abuse victims, uh, don't talk about that, uh, because what's more important is our ecclesial system, <laughs> and not you. Uh, and this is directly contrary uh, to what the church herself teaches. Uh, but that happens in the life of the church, and we find that uh, going on uh, not just with bishops and priests who are complicit in abuse, uh, but we find it in a hundred ways uh, in the life of the church, including this notion that uh, the only really important part of Catholic social teaching is the dignity of the human person part as applied to the unborn. That's, that's really it. That's, 
that's like that's Catholic social teaching, and you can kind of blow off the rest of it. Uh, Catholic Vote, uh, some time back, actually published an article by a guy named Eric Sammons, where he it was he specifically said, "I am no longer pro-life. I am just anti-abortion." Well, guess what? That's not what the church teaches. Uh, and if you weaponize the unborn against all the other uh, assaults on human life, uh, then you are you're making war on the church. So if you say, well, you know, I care so much about abortion that it doesn't matter to me that the church says uh, we need to abolish the death penalty. I've got people on death row that I want to see dead. Uh, and I don't even care if we have to execute some innocent people on death row who were wrongly convicted in order to kill those people on death row who don't need to be killed. I've got this thing about the death penalty, and that's all that matters. And as long as I rub my precious feet pin and say that I'm pro-life and oppose abortion, I can kill as many people as I want on death row, and I don't have to listen to the church. That is the problem that we face, uh, is this um, an, an attempt to, uh, to emphasize some aspect of the church's teaching that we happen to prefer uh, and not merely ignore but actively make war on the rest of the church's teaching that we don't happen to like. Uh, and so that's where this book comes in. Uh, so what the book does is it says, look, the dignity of the human person, absolutely everything is about, everything in Catholic social teaching is about the dignity of the human person. Uh, it's about obedience to the two greatest commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And as Jesus says, the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So at no point can we pit those two commandments against one another. Uh, to pit them against one another is insane. It makes no sense. It is a defiance of the church's teaching. Uh, and we can never privilege one of those commandments over the other in a way that uh, causes this conflict. We certainly must prioritize the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that prioritization can never mean denial of the second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in Pope Francis's teaching, I think this is in uh, Gaudete et Exaltate, he's talking about... Um, He's talking about the great commandment, and he says something like, uh, Jesus cuts through uh, all the prescriptions of the Old Testament law and brings the moral law down to two faces, the face of God and the face of yeah. your neighbor. And then, he, and then he kind of corrects himself, and he says, actually, it's one face, the face of God in the face of your neighbor. Yes. Like, yeah. not... They are they are so not pitted against each other to the point to the point where they become almost the same thing. That's the parable of the sheep and the goats. In as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Uh, and so, yeah. So consequently, what our politics wants to do, as a general rule, is it tends to want to privilege. Usually, it's. Uh, two commandments against the other two commandments. Uh, so, uh, what conservatives tend to like is the dignity of the human person because, you know, that gives you your, your grist for opposing abortion. Uh, also popular on the right is not really subsidiarity, but a kind of whittled down, truncated thing that's called subsidiarity, but it is, isn't really. We'll get to subsidiarity in a minute. And but then, in addition, and I I know this. Uh, oh, hold on. Um, should have gotten rid of that. Um, 
in addition to that, though, are the other two pillars of Catholic social teaching, the common good and solidarity. And I, I know because this actually happened. When I wrote the series uh, on uh, the common good, uh, or uh, on Catholic social teaching and talked about the common good, the first the first piece that I wrote for the register was nothing but uh, a tissue of uh, biblical quotations and then quotations from the fathers, including that one from John Chrysostom, uh, medieval theologians, uh, conciliar teaching, and popes. And the response of numerous readers uh, for the register was, that's just socialism. This is just, you know, this is heretical, right? It's like, no, this is our tradition. You know, I'm not making any of this stuff up, right? <laughs> it's, this is the church's teaching, you know, if, and you've got popes saying things like, you know, whatever you have beyond what you need belongs to the poor. That's communism. No, that is the Catholic tradition, pal. Uh, and what that comes from, of course, the whole teaching of the common good, what it boils down to is if each human person uh, has dignity uh, because they're made in the image and likeness of God, therefore, every human person <laughs> has dignity because they're made in the image and likeness of God, and that means that every human person has a right to the goods of the earth. Uh, and it doesn't depend on what they can produce and all the rest of it. Well, what about, uh, you know, uh, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. Well, what's striking about that statement, which is uh, a historically conditioned statement from one of Paul's letters, where he's writing not the first epistle on welfare reform to the Americans, but he's writing to the Thessalonians, and he's writing to a community in Thessalonica that is convinced that the second coming is just around the corner, and so let's just blow off all of our responsibilities to everything uh, and just, uh, you know, Jesus is going to be here any minute now, I don't need to care about my family. I don't need to provide for the common good. That's what Paul's addressing there. He's talking to Christians uh, and telling them, telling them what? Telling them that you need to earn a living, not so that you can build up a huge bankroll, get rich, uh, or you know have a return on your investment, or all of those sorts of things. He's saying that you need to work with your hands, earn a living, so that A, you can support your family, uh, B, so that you've got something to give. When Jesus addresses the question of how, what do we do uh, with people who come to us begging, he never says, make sure that you get a good return on your investment. Uh, you know, When you give to somebody, make sure that they pay you back. In fact, what he says is make sure that they can't pay you back. Make absolutely certain that you invite to your dinners not people who are going to invite you back and give you a return on your investment. Go out there and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the people who will never be able to pay you back in this life. That's who you should be giving to, says Jesus. And he says that without any qualification whatsoever. Uh, give to him who begs. That's, that's what he tells you. And it's like, wow, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to do that. You know, because, of course, I live in the real world. I got to pay the bills. I can't just give away everything that I've got. Uh, you know, I've got a, a, a wife. I've got children. I've got a, you know, and, and the church recognizes that, which is why these commands uh, exist in the context of the church. But very clearly what the gospel tradition is strongly skewed toward uh, is the reason you have riches, just like the reason you have charisms, is not for you, it's for those people over there, whoever they are. If you're, you know, think about Paul's teaching on spiritual gifts. Why do we have spiritual gifts? For the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, for other people. 
we have certain gifts that are given us to keep. Those are called the sanctifying gifts. So wisdom, counsel, knowledge, etc. But in addition to that, we have all kinds of gifts and charisms. So you're a teacher, for example. You taught uh, uh, on Catholic social teaching recently. That gift of teaching that you have is not for you. It's for the people that you taught. A singer is, or somebody with an ability to do music has that gift for the sake of his listeners or her listeners. Uh, somebody who is, you know, has, you, na you name the charism, somebody with a gift of prophecy has that gift for the sake of the person to whom, or the people to whom he prophesies. And it's exactly the same with our material gifts. Our material gifts are given us, sure, for our good, but mostly for other people's good. And uh, that is something that plays directly into the whole issue of what we mean by the common good. Uh, because there are lots of there, there are a billion people in this world right now, the bottom billion who are desperately poor, who don't know where the next meal is coming from. Uh, and it is up to us who are living among the top billion uh, to see to it that they get the things that they need uh, to the best of our ability. Now, we're not going to be able to, you know, there are people right now that are clamoring, that I know that are clamoring for help that I, I can't help them. Uh, I can help them some, but some of the things that they need are beyond what I can do. But we can try. And we can orient our lives in such a way that that's what we're thinking of first, rather than thinking of what we want. And with that, by the way, goes a kind of reorientation in our mentality that I think is very important. So... One of the things you might have noticed, uh, you're living in, in, are you in Canada, or am I confusing you? I, I'm in Michigan. What's that? Michigan. Okay, great. I'm in Michigan. Okay, great. So one of the things that uh, I noticed over the years, and you might have noticed the same thing, uh, in the United States, we have now, every single day, uh, is a gun massacre. Every day of the year, now there is a gun massacre, more than four people being shot or killed. Uh, and the response to that has generally tended to be twofold. One, for example, after Sandy Hook, the response of people that I call normals was, dear God, what can we do to try to stop this from ever happening again. That is, I think, a gospel response. But there's mm -hmm. another response that's very common as well from a lot of people. And the other response is, don't blame me, don't take my gun. Which one is thinking about the common good? Well, the response that says we have to try to do something to change this is at least attempting to think about the common good. Uh, or the selfish response is just, don't blame me. Like, it's all about the person, <laughs> you know, who, sure, I'm okay, I'm not blaming you, but why are you starting there? Why is that your first concern? Don't blame me, don't touch my gun. Um, there is a school full of dead children, and your first thought is, somebody's going to blame me? There's a, there's a real narcissistic component to that. So one of the things that we can start to do is recognize, where are my narcissistic responses to things? If there's a problem and my first thought is, what about me? Um, we're not thinking with the gospel. We're not thinking with the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is always thinking about the good of the other person. Uh, and, you know, Jesus, of all people, really was the only person... <laughs> That we could look at and say, we can't blame him, you know. And what Jesus did was he took all of that upon himself, even though he did not merit that at all. Uh, he, he took that mindset that it is up to me uh, to 
help my neighbor in whatever way can be done. And that's our call as yeah. Christians as well. So that's kind of the common good. Uh, the next uh, pillar of Catholic social teaching is what the church calls subsidiarity. Subsidiarity uh, is often interpreted uh, in our culture uh, as meaning uh, I get to keep all my money and the state can go to hell. That's not subsidiarity. What subsidiarity actually means is wherever possible, the person closest to the problem should handle the problem. And we only go up the ladder of authority when the person closest to the problem can handle the problem. So, you know, you need a loaf of the, bread. What do you do? The, well, uh, you go to the store and you buy yourself a loaf of bread. Problem solved. No act of Congress required that the... the, the uh, you know, the president did not need to send in the 101st Airborne to deliver bread to your house. That would be a ridiculous violation of subsidiarity. But suppose there's a problem. You can't afford the bread because you don't have a job right now. Okay, what else can you do? Well, you can go to uh, various mediating institutions. You can call your brother-in-law and say, can I borrow 50 bucks for the week? I'm going to start a new job here soon and then I can pay you back. Okay, pro again, problem solved. You didn't have to, you know, call the White House or anything. Um, sometimes that problem can't be solved uh, for other reasons. Maybe you've got the money, you go to the store uh, and uh, the store owner says, we don't serve your kind, you're black, get out. Then what do you do? Now it's time to call in a higher uh, authority so you can this is where you call the police or some representative of the state in order to deal with this clear violation of uh, rights. Human and, decency. Right. And uh, that can wind up going up very high on the ladder. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, eventually what uh, had to happen, for example, for Rosa Parks... Uh, was this this had to go all the way to uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, at the highest levels of government uh, in order to begin to address uh, this issue in a way that, by the way, still needs to be addressed in our country in various ways. Uh, and so that's the idea, is you stay as close to the problem locally as you can. Um, your library needs How a new... Uh, needs a pothole filled in the parking lot. So, you know, somebody who works at the library says, I got a bag of cement, I'll, I'll fix it. You know, problem solved. Uh, but sometimes you have to go high up the ladder indeed, and you have to keep going up the ladder. Uh, so what the church does is it's interested in s subsidiarity primarily because the teaching of the church is that people should be as personally involved uh, in works of charity. They should be personal participants in the work of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, blessing and renewing the face of the earth uh, as possible. So God wants each of us uh, to be participants in that work. I, I wanted to add um, the key thing there is participation in uh, one of his teachings before Fratelli Tutti came out in, in, in one of his catechesis, Pope Francis says, and I'm almost quoting, I'm pretty close. Right. He says that uh, people have the right to participate in the healing and transformation of their own communities. And that's how he defined subsidiarity. Yes. That is what subsidiarity is all about. And so what's interesting is um, it's primarily about our participation uh, in the work of the renewal of the face of the earth. Uh, and the con one of the odd consequences of that, th there are two quite striking things about that. First of all, uh, this means that... Uh, the church has only one exception to what uh, to that basic principle that the people closest to the problem handle the problem, and that's with the use of violence. 
Um, when, when it comes to the use of violence, the church pushes the use of violence as high up the ladder of authority as it possibly can and forbids Hatfields and McCoys, for example, or Crips and Bloods from killing each other. Uh, I don't get, you know, if I, if I suspect that maybe you've done something untoward, I don't get to lock you in my broom closet. Uh, because that's violence. And that belongs to the state. The state can throw you in jail if it, the state has determined that you deserve it. But I don't get to throw you in jail. Uh, and so this is why, for example, the mayor of Seattle cannot declare war on North Korea. Uh, why? Because that goes to the highest level of state authority in the United States. Uh, and if the church had its, had its way, it would go to the UN every single time because that's even higher up, because the goal is to prevent violence. So that's the first thing. The other thing, and this is really paradoxical, is that uh, uh, subsidiarity means that we use the level of authority appropriate to the problem. So there are certain things uh, where it is absolutely appropriate uh, that local people not handle it which is why we don't have teams of people going out and fixing the freeway on their Saturday afternoons. Uh, that's not how it works. The state fixes the freeway because the state built the freeway and because the state has the resources necessary to take care of an interstate system. I don't. Uh, in the same way, uh, uh, it's absolutely appropriate to have a huge, not only state, but international uh, system of authority handling something like a COVID epidemic, uh, rather than uh, you know one libertarian guy in his basement with a chemistry set uh, solving COVID. That's not going to happen, right? What you need, absolutely require for a, for a huge problem like COVID is a huge international solution, and the same thing for things like climate change and so forth. Uh, and so, consequently, it is an expression not of the monstrous, overweening uh, global state, uh, but of Catholic teaching on subsidiarity that three popes, John Paul, Benedict, and Francis, have all said uh, that we are in need of a true I'm quoting here, true world political authority. That gives <laughs> so many American Catholics a heart attack to hear that and to realize that not just one, not just two, but three popes have said this. Uh, but of course, that is subsidiarity. Uh, because for some problems, that's exactly what you do need, is a, is a world political authority. Uh, not for every problem. For most problems, for the overwhelming majority of human problems, what you need is, you know, I need a loaf of bread. Okay, I'll go get a loaf of bread. I need to fix this thing on my car. Okay, I'll fix this thing on my car. Uh, you know, and we don't need the UN to solve that problem. Uh, but that is the basic idea of subsidiarity is, yeah, participation. And then finally... Uh, the last pillar is solidarity. And the basic principle of solidarity uh, is that I cannot look at you and say, your end of the Titanic is sinking. Too bad. Um, we are bound up together uh, as human beings. As human beings, we are connected by the fact that, A, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, therefore, as Terence says, uh, I am a human being, nothing human is alien to me. I'm a man, nothing human is alien to me. And we are also all people for whom Christ died. All people who are uh, intended for eternal glory. Uh, and therefore, it, our destinies are bound up with one another. We are radically connected to one another. Uh, in a way that we can't escape, uh, even if we want to. Uh, and, and the attempt to escape that connection can only lead to our own sadness. 
uh, and possibly to our own eternal loss uh, if we persist in it. So this is Catholic social teaching, and there are all kinds of implications that go with it uh, that are shocking and that we don't think about. So, for example, uh, one of the things that makes Catholic social teaching, Catholic social teaching, uh, is that uh, the, the Chesterton uses the image uh, of uh, the way in which, he, he talks about the way in which reality is almost predictable, but then does weird things that you weren't expecting it to do. So we look at a human being and we see that they have two ears, two eyes, two hands, two legs, uh, two nostrils, and therefore uh, we predict wrongly that they must have two hearts. Nope, just one heart. You weren't expecting that. Catholic teaching does that. So Catholic social teaching, uh, you could almost, almost set your watch uh, by the belief that Catholic social teaching so prioritizes the good of the family that in every single case, Catholic social teaching can be defined as if it's good for the family, it's good. That is true an awful lot of times with Catholic social teaching, but not every time. And here's one of the places where Catholic social teaching, I think, really has something important to say to us today because we are increasingly seeing a turn, uh, particularly among conservative Catholics, toward the belief that uh, the good of the family is the ultimate good. It's an easy thing uh, to fall into, because the good of the family is almost an ultimate good, but it's not the ultimate good. And if we fall for that idea, we wind up falling into what a number of conservative Christians are falling into, which is a kind of uh, blood kinship worship. Uh, so Christian nationalism is growing, for example, right now. What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism uh, is belief in uh, blood and soil uh, as the ultimate good. And it's exactly at that point that the Catholic tradition says, nope, that's actually uh, a, a demonic idolatry uh, that can lead to mass bloodshed. Uh, and so what Jesus does is he's speaking to a culture that took the ties of blood and kinship very, very seriously, as almost all of antiquity did. Uh, he says, who is my mother and brother and sister? He who does the will of my Father in heaven is my father, mother, sister, and brother. And then he goes on and shockingly says, If you would be my disciple, you must hate father, mother, sister, brother, and your own life. So he has this, he, obviously he doesn't mean you must wish you know, illness and death and, and all these things on your family. That's obviously not what he's saying. But he's using hyperbole, which he loves to do, to make the point uh, that much of conservative Christianity in the United States is rapidly losing sight of, which is that the family is not the ultimate good. Uh, that, yes, as the church teaches, the family is the basic building block of society. We absolutely believe that. But here's the thing. Building blocks are for building. What is being built? What is being built is the kingdom of God. And anything that exalts itself above the kingdom of God, I've including the family, says Jesus, is to be radically subordinated yeah. to the kingdom of God. Yeah. And we're not, you know, we're not used to okay. hearing that. I have so many things to say. Uh, and I that think terrifies every, us. Every three you know? minutes, I was like, oh, and Pope Francis says something uh, like this. But... I, um, it's, there's a, it's still true. <laughs> there's there, there's a lot to add, but I I, I want to shift and I want to move it to a little bit more <laughs> uh, in, in in our episodes. We like uh, to talk theory and then towards the end move it towards something more personal. Um, I see in myself over the past you know ten years 
especially since 2016, mm -hmm. I've seen uh, my own my own thoughts develop, especially the more that I've read Catholic social teaching. Um, I have shifted. I used to be a one issue pro-life voter and very proud of that fact for a long time. Um, and it's easy for me to get caught up in the shift. Right. Um, especially when I see I was too. the political homes I used to belong in and with this new light, especially of Catholic social teaching, see some of the deep hypocrisy and toxicity that was, that was there mm -hmm. that may or may not have been there before, but is certainly there now. My impulse is to run in the other direction and just embrace the other side. Um, Mm -hmm. or be more apt to pay less attention right. to uh, the concerning things on the other side. Right. Uh, and I find myself having to temper, uh, having to temper myself to not just go and run in the other direction and hang on there. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, is, is that something, is that something that, that, that you can talk about? How do we, um, how can we be deeply critical right. of one side? Right without wholeheartedly embracing the other almost in a reactive way. Right. Uh, well, the, the, the primary thing is, oh, you vanished again. Um, uh, the primary thing, uh, I think, is that we have to keep the focus on the gospel. Um, not on uh, this ideology versus that ideology. Ideology, as far as I'm concerned, is just another word for heresy. Uh, and so, you know, C.S. Lewis famously says the devil always sends uh, uh, lies into the world in pairs so that fleeing one will embrace the other. Um, we have to keep our focus on the teaching of the church and on the centrality of the gospel uh, and that's all. That means if we are in this life, we are doomed to being neither fish nor fowl, uh, and we're doomed to being perceived always as uh, servants of the other side. Uh, you know, if you oppose uh, uh, something that conservatives say, they will always accuse you of you know being a baby killing liberal, or you know that's a favorite. Uh, insult and and if you you know if you say well actually I do uh, accept the church's mm -hmm. teaching on the family w and that means uh, among other things if you believe in Christian marriage that means there is only one uh, place for sex it's it's in uh, committed heterosexual Christian marriage you hate gay people no I don't. I simply accept the fact that uh, uh, the church's teaching uh, on marriages, uh, one man, one woman, uh, life, and, and by the way, the church's teaching on marriage is, of course, addressing Christian marriage. So uh, although the church recognizes there is such a thing as natural marriage, so just marriage between two unbaptized people, great, that's a real marriage, uh, says the church. Uh, but the goal of Christian marriage is sacramental Christian marriage, marriage between two baptized people that images the relationship between uh, Christ the bridegroom and his bride the church. Uh, which I also, you know, that's also part of the church's social teaching. Uh, none of that has to imply uh, c contempt for gay people, which, by the way, is a real problem in the life of the church is deep, deep hatred and contempt uh, for LGBT uh, people. And the failure there is, yet again, a failure to grasp the church's teaching on the dignity of the human person. Uh, because the church's teaching on the dignity of the human person encompasses uh, LGBT people. Uh, and so... Uh, if we're not living that out, why the hell should any gay person take us seriously when we say 
uh, that God loves them if we're showing them nothing but contempt and the first thing that they hear from us is not the love of God, but here's what's wrong with you, pal, and now I'm going to fix you. Um, nobody uh, accepts that when it's done to them, right? If you meet some total stranger and he, you know, the first thing that he has to say to you is, here's what's wrong with you, and God hates you, you know, and all of that, would you listen to that guy? I wouldn't, you know, because... I'm a human being. And so we have to start always with a focus on what it is the tradition really be reveals to us. And the first thing that the tradition reveals to us is the dignity of the human person uh, and the fact that man and woman, any human person that you meet anywhere in the world uh, is the only creature on earth whom God has created for their own sake, not for some other end. Uh, and so much of our life as Christians is consumed with the idea of turning people into means to some other end because of something that we need. Uh, and that need is often born, comes right out of sin, uh, our own sin. I'm nervous about uh, being a Catholic I don't know what to do with uh, the church's teaching on sexuality, so I need you to not be gay. And I'm going to make you not be gay <laughs> if it's the last thing I do and if it kills you, you know. Uh, that's not uh, respect for the dignity of the human person. And we can do that with almost anything. I, I, I have an economic system that I need you uh, to fit into, even if it chews you up and spits you out, and so um, I'm gonna, yeah, I will preach communism or capitalism or something uh, at you, even if it kills you, because I've got this system that is more important than you are, uh, and uh, so much uh, of the destruction that we wreak as as Christians, who often we think we're doing the right thing. Uh, comes from the fact that we don't really, no, I, we do not really believe. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly the case. That's something that, that human um, beings are the only creatures uh, whom God has I talk with people about the uh, dignity we of the human really person, I use the word infinite, and I'm like, yeah. this this proclamation should hurt. It should make us think twice, because if it's true, it ought to change. Right. Um, it ought to change so much. Mark, thank you so much for for being with us um right yeah and uh so, so we'll put the link to right. your book in our show notes and um it's great talking with you oh a pleasure hopefully we'll get to talk again yeah i look forward to it i hope so all right god bless you and god bless your work in the vineyard you what you guys are doing is really important so thank you for it Thank you so much, Mark. It was wonderful to have you with us. We do want to take a moment just to, well, actually, Mark, where, how, where can people find you online? Again, we'll put the link in the show notes, but for those who are listening to the podcast. I, uh, uh, you can find me, uh, I have a blog uh, called Stumbling Towards Heaven, uh, uh, Mark P. Shea, S -H -E -A, dot com, all one word. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can also, you can find my books at uh, Amazon, and I'm also knocking around on Facebook, and you'll you can see me on Twitter as well. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, we want to take a quick moment to thank uh, the sponsor for this uh, this show. They sponsored us for a whole year, and so we're incredibly grateful to select to give more Catholic leaders choose select international tours than any other pilgrimage company with 35 years of award-winning travel planning. They have a track record of excellence and faithfulness, and they're a small company with a big heart because every one of their pilgrimage trips uh, helps to support and fund their 501c3 charity work, which is helping Christian families thrive in the Holy Land. So if you're ready to travel or if you're looking to lead a group of your own, take the next step in your pilgrimage by visiting selectinternationaltours.com. Paul, if people want to follow the show, uh, send you a question, complain about something, praise you for something, uh, or us, or me, where can they go? Yeah, uh, you can find me and the, the host for the host site for this podcast is popefrancisgeneration.com. You can uh, follow my newsletter there. You can follow the podcast. Uh, you can become uh, a paid subscriber. 
um, and support this work. And uh, I'm always grateful for that. Fantastic. So PopeFrancisGeneration.com. And also, if you enjoy this, we do post this over in SmartCatholics.com. It's also, uh, it's kind of a co-production with Paul. And Smart Catholics, it's the online community for Catholic millennials, creators, and learners who want faithful conversations that are unafraid of doubts and questions together. And let's get smarter. Um, Till next time, friends, say a short prayer for yourself and for us. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Doubts can be a sign that we want to know God better and more deeply. Thanks again. God bless you.